All right. Uh, Al, if you can, I don't see you're driving. This is not a, a British vehicle. I am not driving. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and pray for us, and then we'll, um, we'll begin. We've got some folks coming in on YouTube right now. And so, um, anyway, good time. Go ahead, Pastor Stout. All right. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, I pray you would bless our evening, even as we are far apart from each other. Uh, would you allow uh, the technology that we use to not be a hindrance into our fellowship? Uh, but actually allow the, uh, the McNeils to communicate and uh, be a blessing to uh, your body here at Providence as we discuss uh, the wonderful work of foster care uh, in our community. Uh, we ask you to do all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who is Lord and Savior. Amen. All right, all right McNeils. So if you would just like to just um, kind of um, introduce everybody to foster care and um, a little bit about your story and how you got involved and um, how we might uh, be better uh, in this area as a church as well. So, all right. Well, thanks, Al, for the uh, for praying for us, and uh, thank you, Alan Yuri, for the opportunity to to speak about foster care uh, tonight. It's obviously uh, something that's near and dear to our heart. And, uh, we really have a heart to share it with others too. And so I appreciate everybody who's dialed in or is on YouTube watching this and um, all the names that I see on the screen, uh, we know you and, and you know us, but in case somebody on YouTube watches this later who doesn't know us, let me just introduce us real quick. Um, I'm Ken and this is Jenny McNeil. Um, we uh, live here in Pensacola. Uh, we have seven biological kids uh, between the ages of five and 18. Uh, our oldest, Hannah, is graduating this year from uh, Trinitas and uh, heading off to, uh, to college. And uh, as we were just talking about, I'm not sure if uh, this was rolling, but we ha currently have a, a two-year-old uh, foster daughter who's been with us for a week now, a week uh, yesterday, a week ago yesterday. And uh, she's just been a real joy. Um, and it's been a, it's been a, a good week for us. Um, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about just what the Bible says about foster care, about orphan care, uh, and a little bit about why we decided to, to, uh, to foster. And then I'll turn it over to Jenny to talk about our story. Uh, and Jenny is also a social worker, a, license, uh, a licensing agent uh, at um, One More Child, which is a local foster uh, agency here. She's been working with them for a couple months now. And uh, so she can talk much better about um, the need here in the Pensacola area, uh, as well as how um, as, as a body, the church can be involved in foster care, uh, either directly or indirectly. Um, so we'll probably, I'll, we'll talk for about 20, 25 minutes. Um, certainly if you have any questions while we're talking, go ahead and jump in, but uh, we'll have uh, just some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, and uh, just fire away with anything that you've got. So, um, you know, after uh, our story is, uh, I guess every story is unique, but we were married for 18 years. Um, and had seven children before we got into foster care. Uh, so we've been foster parents since uh, December of 2018. Um, and uh, it's been just an amazing experience for not only for us, but for our children as well. Um, and so I, I hope that uh, our enthusiasm for that comes across tonight. It certainly has been uh, challenging in many ways, but it's been probably one of the, the richest uh, experiences of our lives uh, in many ways. Um, as far as the biblical mandate, just I want to talk a little bit about what the Bible says about orphan care. And uh, there's a number of verses in the Bible, uh, but I'm just going to touch on a couple of them real quick. The first uh, is from 1 John 3, 16 and, and 18. And it says, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And that's just a, that really sums up um, orphan care right there. Um, basically, Christ did this for us. I mean, he, he died on the cross for us and adopted us into his family. Um, Christ saw our brokenness, and he came into our broken lives and our broken world, and he embraced us in our weakness, and he adopted us into his family, and that's changed the course of our lives forever, the trajectory um, of our of our our lives for eternity. Um, and so Christ modeled this through love for us. And so 
uh, orphan care for us is a chance for us to, to carry out this example that he set for us here, uh, here on earth. Um, another verse that comes up a lot is uh, James 1.27, which says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Um, in this verse, the Bible makes it pretty clear um, that we're to love and to take care of um, one another. Um, this verse is a call for Christians to make it a mission um, to take care of uh, all children, uh, whether that's through adoption, whether that's through foster care, or whether it's for care of the pre-born, um, the pro-life movement, and, and support of young mothers and, and, uh, and children. And um, so for us, it's... Um, I mean, it's, it's biblical, um, and it's something that we've always felt called to do. Um, now, you know, foster care may not be for everyone. Um, there's no scripture mandate that says everyone should be involved in foster care. But I do think that the Bible is pretty clear um, that, um, that there's strong directives towards radical hospitality, towards the needy. And really, this is um, just a way that we can bring and people into our family, into our home, and share our lives and share the gospel. Um, not only are we sharing our lives, but we're sharing Christ with these children. Um, a couple of things, reasons why we, uh, we also do foster care is uh, foster care provides just a daily reminder to us for our need for the gospel. Um, just stepping into a broken world like this, um, and really putting ourselves in a situation that sometimes can seem out of our control uh, just really makes us have to lean on Christ, especially in our weakness. Um, and this puts the need for the gospel on display for our family. Um, just one of the best things about foster care is just for our kids and our family just to, to see um, the gospel lived out in their lives every day as well. Um, it's a window into a world that we probably wouldn't normally see. Uh, broken families, um, just generational poverty and poor mistakes as a result of sin and suffering. And um, it also provides a great platform for our family um, to share the gospel with others. Um, I can't tell you how many times that we've been asked, you know, why do you do this? You guys have seven children. Um, what is it that makes you want to be foster parents? And, and there's nothing like that question just to, to really open the window wide open to share the gospel. Um, and um, so these are a few reasons why um, we have felt led to, to foster, um, but mostly just because Christ demonstrated this uh, just through, through his death on the cross and through his adoption, uh, adopting us into his family. And so um, we see this as just an important thing that we can do um, here on earth. So um, that's just a little bit about the, uh, you know, what the Bible says. I mean, there's numerous Bible verses that talk about um, you know, God being the father to the fatherless in Psalm 68 and Psalm 146.9 says God sustains the fatherless and the widow. Um, and so uh, it's interesting. Our daughter Hannah did her senior thesis uh, on orphan care. and It was called um, The Case for Orphan Care, the Responsibility of the Church to Care for the Fatherless. Um, and it was really neat just to see her capture this vision uh, for, for orphan care as well. Um, and I probably should get Hannah on here. She probably could talk uh, just probably for the full hour on, on the case for uh, the church um, caring for the orphans uh, and for the widow. Um, it's been something that's uh, the church used to be really good at it. And over the, uh, over the decades, we've sort of abdicated this responsibility to the government. Um, and it's certainly a broken system and it's a messy system. And it's one that um, the church really needs to step um, back into this role um, to care for the orphans and the widows. Um, and so we feel very privileged to, uh, to be a part of a church that uh, makes this mission such a priority. Um, and Yuri and I, we, we very much appreciate that. Uh, we appreciate all that uh, our church does uh, for the pro-life, uh, you know, the, the care of the pre-born and, and mothers and for the support that the church has provided for us over this last year, if we, as we have been new foster parents, um, the church families that have come alongside us to help us with uh, respite care, uh, with meals, 
transportation, various various ways the church has served us, um, and certainly through prayer. Um, that has been just a huge source of encouragement and help for us this past year. Um, in fact, tonight the Kalishes and the Nolans brought us over a meal tonight, so we were just enjoying some of that uh, that great uh, hospitality and, and love from our church family. So um, I'm going to go and turn it over to Jenny to talk a little bit about our story in particular. And uh, Jenny. Um, I'm sure most of you know some of our story, at least you've heard us, or you've seen us in church with kids. Um, we got licensed to be foster parents back in December of 2018. Um, our first placement, we got a baby boy and a baby girl. Um, we had no idea what to expect. It was, um, we were overwhelmed. <laughs> we didn't know anything about foster care. We wound up having them for, we didn't know if it's going to be long-term or short, short term. You usually don't know. Um, we wound up having them for only two days. Um, this was right before Christmas. And then the day after Christmas, we got a 12 month old little boy who wound up being in our home for, um, most of you know him, <laughs> wound up being in our home for almost a year until October of last year. Um, and it was amazing. It was the hardest thing we've ever done. <laughs> and it was also one of the things probably that brought us the most joy. Um, one of the books that I'm, I'm going to plug a book here, but it's called Reframing Foster Care. And if anyone is interested in um, foster care, this is the book that I recommend. But the quote of that book that meant the most to me is, it's the mercy of God that he doesn't show us everything that will unfold in the foster care and adoption journey the moment we first say yes to it. All the hard would be too unbearable and all the good would be too unbelievable. Um, and I, I absolutely believe that. And looking back on the last year, year and a half of foster care, I can definitely say that that's true. That the good, we could have never believed how gracious God would be to us in this and all the good that we would see. Um, and it was hard. It was harder than we um, could have anticipated. Um, and knowing that going into it, we may not have, you know, chosen to do the same thing. So I'm very thankful that God just kept us, um, right where we needed to know. Um, so we got this little boy and he was precious and he became part of our family, um, right away. Um, the kids, um, just took, took to him right away. Um, I've just been amazed to see how our kids have taken in these foster children and love them like their sibling, um, taking care of them, um, all those things. So we thought we had our hands full. We had a lot of unexpected things go on in our family with health issues and other things that were hard. And so we thought, you know, we can just take this one little guy. This is all we can handle. Um, but God had different plans for us. And in June of last year, uh, we got a call um, from the caseworker that said his little sister had been born. Um, we thought that she would get to stay with mom. And they said, she has been removed. Can you take her in two hours? And so we said, wow. <laughs> so I remember having that conversation when we were sure that we could not handle more than one, um, having that conversation with Ken and literally getting on our knees together and praying, God, if you want us to do this, just please make it clear. And we felt like um, God gave us a strong yes that we were supposed to take this little girl as well. So we wound up with this brother and sister um, who, again, she just became the light of our life, just like he was. Um, and then God continued to, um, to work and we developed over the course of this year, a relationship with their biological mom. Um, and one of the things about foster care that I don't think is talked about as much is the ministry that it is to the family of these children. It's not just about the children that you're taking in. It's a ministry to the entire family because so often in foster care, um, children that are in care are in care because of generational trauma, what their parents have been through. Um, their parents are often a product of the foster care system themselves. They've been through um, drug problems or they've been through, um, you know, abusive situations all these traumas that they have endured and they really just don't know how um, to get out of that cycle. So we were able to develop a relationship with 
um, their mom that we still have. I just talked to her today. <laughs> we, um, and we have um, that ministry with her as well. So I think that's an important, important part of, um, of foster care to think about. So our story, um, we thought we were on the path to reunification with these kids. Um, and it turned out that that wasn't what happened at all. But in the process, can you, can you explain what, what you mean by reunification? Sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, well, when you start foster care, the goal is reunification. They will tell you that. The goal is to reunite these children with their biological family. Um, and pretty much every case starts out as the goal of foster care is reunification. Um, but the parents are given a case plan to work. Um, things that they have to meet, goals that they have to hit within a certain time frame for them to be able to reunify with their children. Um, if they are unable to do that, then adoption may become the goal of the case plan. So when we started, reunification was the goal and we assumed that it was going in that direction. Um, mom was working very hard on her case plan. Um, and then for various reasons, it did not turn out that way. Um, but we had developed relationships within the church um, with the Kalishes, and they had become a respite family for us and had helped us out um, with child care, with meals, um, even once when uh, we had a major sickness going through our house and our son Jacob wound up in the hospital, um, the hunters and the Kalishes took the kid, um, took, we just had the one, took him for us um, and kept him. They kept, when um, Ken's dad passed away and we had to go out of town, they kept the kids for us for a week. So they had developed a relationship with the kids as well. And through various circumstances, um, bio mom got to know them as well, got, you know, came to trust them and they wound up having um, the chance to adopt these kids. So um, the kids that you know now as Teddy and Mila um, are, um, they were a blessing to us for a year, and we are thankful for the, I mean, God's grace just being so evident all the way, all the way through this story and seeing how it worked out for them. Um, but even in that, we feel like um, we still have this relationship with their mother, their biological mother, um, and we still um, hope to be able to continue to minister her, minister to her. Um, after um, Teddy and Mila moved out, moved in with the Kalishes, we took a short break from foster care, um, from having kids in our home. And I think that's an important part too, is that there are, there are seasons of rest <laughs> in foster care where you have to step back and, um, and just really minister to your own family and take care, you know, take a break, take a break, take a breather, do what's right for your family. Um, but then we recently relicensed and we are back in it again. And last week we were able to take a two-year-old little girl. Um, we don't know a ton about her background yet, which is not unusual. It can be two or three weeks before you talk with the caseworker and really get details. Um, but what we do know is that she needs a safe place to be right now. And she's really starting to open up and you know, settle in nicely here. So um, that's kind of our journey as far as foster care. One, one other placement we had was a teenage girl that we had um, for, um, for, I think we had her one, one night. Just I one think. night, yeah. Um, and you looked at this girl that we had in our home and her rap sheet, as you might wanna call it, was, unbelievable, you know, all of the um, issues that she had and all of the reasons why, you know, some would say you would not want this kind of child in your home. Um, and she was a delight. Like we really enjoyed having her here. Um, and as you get to know these children, one thing I think that has struck us and I think is so many people is they're just kids. Um, you now there are, they are kids from hard places often, um, there are behaviors that come with that sometimes because of the trauma that they've been through, but by and large, they're just children um, and they just need a safe place to be. So um, that's kind of our story. Do you have anything to Yeah, I was just uh, sort of going back to the 
for the why we just started fostering a couple of years ago. Um, you know, we've been married for 20 years now. I think we've always had a heart for adoption. Um, we were in the Navy uh, for a full career and moved around a lot. And so it wasn't really feasible. Not saying it wasn't possible, but it was would have been more difficult to uh, to foster as much as we were moving around uh, the country. But we finally settled here in Pensacola. Um, and we had seven biological kids at this at this point. And so we sort of figured we had too many kids to be able to foster. I think there used to be some regulations about how big a family could be in order to bring more kids into the home. But uh, it was actually um, a friend of mine, well, an acquaintance who uh, was, a, was a pilot up at Whiting Field. And um, on Facebook, I had seen him talking about being a foster parent and I knew they had 10 or 11 kids, uh, biological kids, and then they were foster parents. And so uh, I called him up and just said, hey, well, you know, tell us your story. And so he did. And, um, and so for a lot of people, I think they just don't, maybe they don't know anybody that's fostered before. Um, so for us, just reaching out and talking to somebody local here that was doing it um, and realizing that, you know, we could actually do this. And so we prayed a lot about it. And, um, you know, fortunately, that's something that God had put on both of our hearts. And so we were um, certainly um, on the same page there. Um, and after a lot of prayer, we just decided to, to jump into it with both feet. And um, it's, um, I guess, you know, expect the unexpected is something you hear a lot about. We had sort of figured that any kids that came into our home would either reunify or we would adopt them. Um, and then with uh, Teddy and Mila, that obviously wasn't the case. Um, and, and God had other plans there. And what a, what a wonderful thing to be a part of that story um, and to, to still be a part of their lives. And, um, and so this little girl that just came to us last week, you know, all we knew is that she was a two-year-old uh, girl. They don't give you any information about race. Uh, they don't give you a name um, or any of the background uh, for the most part. And uh, it's pretty surreal when the car pulls up in the driveway and, and uh, somebody gets out and they hand you a young child. And um, it's, it's pretty amazing. And of course, the kids were excited. We all went out and tried not to be too overwhelming, although we're always overwhelming. Um, but I just remember the look on her face this week, last week. And then when, when uh, Teddy first came to us, the look on his face. Um, and just it's a, such a they, it's a new completely unfamiliar surrounding and, and people to them. And, and, um, but all you can do is just, just pour into them and love on them. And it's, uh, and, and they, they love you back. And it's, it's been a pretty amazing experience, but that's how we jumped back into or how we got into it here just a couple of years ago. So, so Ken, maybe talk a little bit about bringing the kids, your own children along and how do you talk to them about foster care and uh, pre I guess, prepare them. And obviously your children don't get the final say in whether or not you have uh, right. foster kids coming announced, but they're, but they're an important part of your uh, decision-making, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's a family, you know, it certainly affects the whole family, uh, especially the children. And, and so we sat down and we talked to the kids before we decided to foster and, and we told them we were thinking about it and we prayed with them about, about it and talked to each of them together and individually to see what their thoughts are, uh, were on it. Um, for those of you that may not know our family, we, we have a, a couple of uh, boys that have special needs that are on the autism spectrum. And we were particularly concerned about, about them and just socially, um, social interaction and, and personal space and those type of things. Uh, we don't have a big house. We just have a four bedroom house. And so um, we wanted to make sure that everybody was supportive of that and, and really Every one of our kids was excited about it um, and were on board with it. So that, that made it an easier decision. Um, and then when we took a break here this, this last few months and then decided to, to take another placement, we talked to the kids again about it. And, and so it's important to, to, to get the input from the children uh, because it is a, a big decision that impacts the whole family. But I will say um, that these children that we've brought into our home have been just an incredible blessing, not only to us, but to our children as well. They'll, they'll tell you that. Uh, and, when, and when we did take a break, our kids asked us on the daily basis, when will we get, in a, when are we getting another child? When are we going to do it again? When are we going to foster again? Um, they very much <laughs> enjoyed being a part 
being a part of their lives. Um, so it wasn't something that we felt like we had to um, push them into. Um, and the way we explained it to them is these are kids and their mommy and daddy can't take care of them right now. You know, obviously the older kids understood, a, you know, a more in-depth picture of foster care, but to the younger kids, we just said their mommy and daddy can't take care of them right now. And so we're going to take care of them until their mommy and daddy get better and they can take care of them again. Um, and then, you know, like in the case of adoption, we said their mommy and daddy didn't get better um, enough that they were able to take care of them. They still love them, but they can't take care of them right now. And so um, even our youngest kids seem to seem to grasp that pretty well. Um, yeah, they, they had a pretty, pretty neat understanding of it, more than you would think a young, young children would have. Yeah. Now, and Jenny will tell you probably about, more about the organization that she works for, One More Child, but um, in this particular case, it's a Christian organization, which uh, they've been just a, a huge blessing um, and a support to, to our family. Uh, but we were able to tell them uh, we are licensed for kids ages newborn all the way up to 18. But since we have young kids in the house, we had told them we were only at this time um, uh, interested in kids uh, that were newborn to, to five, I think, you know, five years old. And so they um, try to work within the parameters of what works for your family. Um, and certainly that can change and you can, you can change that if as your circumstances uh, um, change as well. But uh, that's, that's why we've had kids on the younger uh, end. But there are so many children uh, of all ages, um, especially a lot of you know, teenagers and preteens that, uh, that need homes as well. It's there's obviously a certain set of challenges uh, and rewards that come along with with that, but uh, we've our experience has been with kids under the age of five. Yeah, and before you talk about the organization and maybe the needs that you see in our community um, out there, um, does anybody have any other questions uh, about foster care in general or their own experience with foster care uh, for the McNeils? Anybody have any questions? Uh, Jenny. And Ken, what is a myth of foster care that um, you would like to see undone? I think the perception is that these are these kids are just going to be trouble. <laughs> it's going to be uh, it's going to be hard, and, and it is hard sometimes. Um, but what a joy they are um, and what a blessing they've been to our family. Um, unfortunately for a lot of these kids, um, as Jenny was saying, you know, sometimes in their, in their file, if they've had to be removed from a home or they've had some personal issue, it's, it's almost like a black mark and it, it follows them. Uh, and so um, a lot of these kids come to, to a family and there's already preconceived notions about what these kids will be like. And um, you just have to keep in mind their circumstances and where they're from and, and uh, just, just that they're children that need a loving home. Um, they, need a, they need an earthly father and they need a heavenly father. Mm. Like the little girl that's in our care right now, we're her fourth home in two months. Wow. Um, and if you can just imagine all the upheaval that has been in her life and just mistrust and in her little mind, she has picked up she is taken by a stranger to another stranger's house and dropped in the driveway. Um, that's essentially what happens. And um, but you look at that on paper, well, why has she been passed from home to home to home? What's wrong with her? Um, and it's not that way at all. Um, these kids have come from very hard situations and a lot of the times they're moved for reasons that are beyond their control. Um, so I would, yeah, that is definitely the biggest one, just that, there's somehow damaged goods and you know that um, you take these children who come from really hard places and you place them in a, you know, somewhere where they are getting love and support and um, nutrition, basic things like that. Um, and just to see how they turn around. I mean, like I said, with her, even in the last week, the changes that we've seen um, have been amazing. And the kids that we've had before that have come to us you know, with them telling us they are delayed, they have these problems, they have this, you know, this problem or that problem. Um, and then given the right environment, that wasn't the case at all. 
Anybody else? All right. Oh, so Jenny, maybe just talk a little bit about uh, the need for foster parents in our community, um, in, uh, in Santa Rosa and Escambia counties. And then <clears throat> maybe, I guess, I don't know how much you know about the, the way the, the, the different foster families work, but the need for Christians to step in and do this type of work to provide that environment, like, you know, the, the child that's moved four or five times, mm -hmm. it may be because the foster parents just aren't able to do it, but they've been approved for whatever reason uh, right. by the state or. Okay. Um, this is my favorite part <laughs> um, to talk about what the need is. Um, the number one reason that kids are in care is neglect. Um, and a lot of times that is tied to drug abuse and those kind of things. Um, and we're seeing the same thing in our area. Um, right now in our local area, um, one more child that I work for is through, it's formerly known as Baptist, Florida Baptist Children's Homes. Um, and they serve Escambia, Santa Rosa, Okaloosa, and Walton counties. In those four counties right now, there are 704 children in care. Um, that's a pretty big number <laughs> for four counties. Um, just in Escambia County, we currently have 200 more children than we have beds for children. Um, so we have 200 more foster kids than we have families willing to take them. And what happens to those kids is more often than not, sibling groups get split up um, because you very rarely find one child in foster care. They almost always have siblings, sometimes five, six, seven, eight siblings. Um, there's, they're often very big families um, whether they're half siblings or full siblings. Um, and most families can't take that many at one time. So they want, they wind up splitting them up. Um, older kids often are harder to place because they have a longer rap sheet. They have reasons um, or behaviors where they don't want to place them. And what happens to them is they often get shipped all over the state. Um, right now we have kids as young as newborn getting shipped to Orlando and Miami um, where that's where they have a spot for them. And so that's where they get sent. Um, and you can imagine what that does to um, their possibility of reunifying with their family when mom can't have visits anymore um, and they can't visit with their siblings anymore. And it's just traumatic to move, not only you know be taken from your family, but move far away from the school that you were in or anything else that was familiar to you. Um, so right now, um, there's a huge need in this area for foster parents. And of those foster kids, only about 50% will reunify. The other 50% will need to be adopted. Um, so that's a, another huge part of the puzzle is the adoption part. That's something that we haven't done yet. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that <laughs> eventually does um, happen. But these foster kids, there are, I think, about 120,000 in our country just waiting to be adopted. Their parental rights have already been terminated. And, um, and of those, about 20,000 every year age out of the system. So they turn 18 and they're no longer foster kids, but they turn 18 with no family to support them, no one to go back home to, no one to help them get started in, you know, in life help them get their first job, find their first house, whatever the case may be. Um, and about half of those kids will never graduate from high school. Um, about a quarter of them will, a, a solid quarter of them will wind up incarcerated in the next two years. Um, so the need is huge. Um, there are other, there are other um, agencies who foster, I mean, who, provide foster care um, that are not Christian agencies. They provide families for these guys to go to, um, but obviously their standards are not Christ-centered in any way. Um, and I mean, you have same-sex couples, you have the whole gamut and you know, it doesn't, they can be approved for foster care without any type of Christian worldview, obviously. So um, 
the perspective of Christians being foster homes, that is where the need is, that these people, that these children and these families would be ministered to um, and the gospel be brought to them through this. Um, unfortunately, in foster care, there, um, there's a lot of abuse um, with families who are not Christian foster families, because if you are someone who um, preys on children, then what better environment than to bring children into your home who have no one to listen to them, who have, who no one will believe. Um, and it, it unfortunately is a prime target for, um, for children, for people who would um, mistreat children. So that is where the importance of Christian families and good, good homes comes in. Um, because otherwise these children are going to wind up in homes who may not have the best motives. Um, one thing I just want to mention, uh, obviously these are pretty unusual times with this COVID virus and uh, this self-isolation. And, and as we start to um, resume normal activities across the country, um, there's going to be a dramatic increase of number of kids going into foster care. Um, right now, these children are not seeing doctors, they're not seeing teachers, um, people that would um, be able to see the signs of abuse and be able to uh, notify the authorities and have them removed from dangerous situations. So there's a lot of children right now that are unfortunately suffering um, in the homes that they're in right now because uh, nobody is, has been able to, to intervene on their behalf. And I think we probably will see the number of children in foster care increase dramatically over the next year here. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is, uh, and Jenny maybe would mention this anyway, but some of the foster families that she is licensed and she is um, doing home studies for, if you could tell them about the, the really large family and then the, uh, the, the elderly couple that does babies. Yeah, um, this is one of my favorite, you were talking about myths, you know, of who can foster and who can't. Um, one is that all ages can foster. Um, we have a family, we have two families in their 70s um, who foster with through our agency and their heart is for babies and they take newborns and they just love them and squeeze them and <laughs> take such good care of them. They've been foster parents for years. They don't feel like they're at an age where they can chase toddlers all over the house or or, you know, keep up with big kids, but they can take care of babies and they do. And we have another family who um, they're in their mid sixties and they just adopted a three-year-old and they're about to adopt a 12 month old. Um, they have children and grandchildren, um, but they have more to give. They want to share more love with these kids and they're amazing. So it's a complete myth that you have to be a certain age or you have to have young children in the house. Um, you can foster at any age. Um, also single, married. Um, we have single moms, we have single dads um, who foster. Um, they, if they work, then they have, you know, they use daycare or whatever, but they are building their family through foster care. Um, working parents, it's a myth that, you know, if both parents are working, well, then you can't foster. Not true at all. Um, we have, um, we have, Foster care provides, the state provides stipends for childcare. They provide vouchers, they provide um, adopt, you know, subsidies for these families so they can have childcare while they work. Um, if you think, well, I can't, I don't know that I would want, you know, could foster teens as Ken talked about before, or maybe I like my sleep too much. I don't think I could do newborn babies. <laughs> you really do have, you can say, you know what, this is what works best for my family right now. Um, we have one home that only takes teenage girls. This woman has a heart for teenage girls. We have a home that takes expectant teenage girls um, because you have a lot of foster teen girls who are expecting their own babies. And I mean, what a great ministry that I hope maybe one day <laughs> we get to do to take in teenage moms and allow these foster kids who are the moms to have their babies there and then be able to mentor them in taking care of their own children. Um, so just depending on where you are and what you feel like God's called you to, there, there is something that you have to offer to any of these. Um, if you 
have a medical background, we have medical foster homes where these are homes that, you know, maybe the kids have a feeding tube or, you know, set diabetic or some other medical need. Well, they can go to a medical foster home and let's say you're a nurse or have some kind of medical background, then you can use your, use your expertise there. Um, if you feel like I want to foster, but it, you know, I don't think I could do it all the time, but you could be a respite family because there are always families um, in need of someone just to take them for a week or just to take them for the weekend or just to not just to provide a break for the foster families, but also allow them to go on a family vacation or, or whatever. Sometimes it's a situation where they need to leave the state and the child's not allowed to leave the state. Um, so respite families, there's, there is a way that almost everyone can serve. Um, and so I think that is one of the, one of the things that maybe people don't fully understand that you think that when you sign up for foster care, I have to take newborn to 18 years old and, you know, that you don't have any say so in it. And that's not true. You really, um, you really can minister in a way that you feel called to, um, but in a way that also serves these families. So. so I know like with one more child, the agency we, we had gone through that she now works for, um, there's obviously a lot of paperwork, a lot of background checks, uh, those type of things. And these take time. It's, it's sort of a slow moving process, but um, we did then end up going through um, classes, which Jenny's not going to teach. Um, I think it was five weekends. We just did it in two. Usually it's two, over two weekends. It's 24 hours of classes. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, the training is really good. Uh, if you go through one more child, probably Jenny will be doing your training for you. Um, and uh, then once the paperwork gets approved, uh, we had said, well, how long until uh, you'll, get a, you'll get a call for a child? And they said, probably the same day the paperwork gets approved. That's how great the need is. So, uh, and I think that's- Our, our first says. placement, they called us and said, can you take this placement? Your license has not yet, yet been approved, but we can push it through today if you'll take these. And so we said, okay, <laughs> so we, that's what happened. Um, and they joke that five minutes is when you'll get a placement because that's how great the need is. And that, that really is true. Yeah. In that particular case, we had a, a young brother and sister that came to us and they only ended up being with us for a couple of days. And then they found a, a relative that was willing to step up and um, take at least temporary custody of the kids. Um, so again, you, you don't really necessarily know how long you're going to have the kids for. Um, you know, people have asked, well, how long are you going to have this little two-year-old for? And I, I don't know. Um, we do know that she was removed from the home a few weeks ago and then went to a relative for a while and then for various reasons uh, ended up in a foster home and then came to us as well. So um, she's a little further into the foster system than say a child that was just removed a couple of days ago. Um, so we don't know. Um, and that's, there's a lot of unknowns to it. So it certainly is, uh, is uh, a step of faith in that respect um, as well. McNeil's. I'm sorry, go ahead. Just a quick question to follow up on that, Can Talk a little bit about the, the emotional dimension of fostering. Uh, we've known some families who have fostered for a couple of years, and then the child was reunified with their biological parents. Talk about how that feels like. Is that a, is that a, a common fear of potential foster parents? Because I cannot imagine having these children, treating them as their own, the familiarity that exists once they're part of your community for that long, and then suddenly having me to uh, say goodbye. Just if you just to uh, talk a little about the emotional component of fostering. Um, yeah, I mean, it's that something you hear a lot is like, I could never foster because I'd be too attached. And, you know, I don't know if that's supposed to imply that if you do foster that you somehow have this supernatural ability not to get attached to the kids. I, that's definitely a myth. Um, that's probably the hardest part of fostering is, um, is having to say goodbye to the, to, to the kids that have been in your care and that you've loved as your own kids for, for weeks, months, or even years in some cases. Uh, so no question about it. That's a very difficult part of foster care. Um, but I think you just have to look at it as that the time that you have with them is precious. And it's such, um, 
you know, especially in these young kids, it's such a formative time of their life. Um, just to show them unconditional love and to, to pray over them and to pray with them and to bring them to church and have them, you know, sing in church and hear the gospel. I mean, that's certainly not time wasted. Uh, and it is hard. And I know, you know, um, especially with, with, with Teddy and Milo, um, it's a beautiful story, and I love that we still get to see them at church, uh, but it certainly was hard uh, not to have them in our home, and, and so there was a grieving process there as well, and certainly we rejoice with the Kalishes and, and uh, with our church family, and, and, uh, but I think about the trajectory of their lives and how radically it was changed uh, through, um, through God's grace, and just that we got to be a part of that story even though it was less than a year, is uh, it's just been a real blessing. I think um, just the whole attachment thing, the getting to attach. I've heard people say, if you get too attached, you're doing it right. <laughs> um, and I think and I think that's really true um, because these kids don't need a babysitter. They need a mom and dad. And so they don't need someone that's going to treat them differently than their other kids. They need someone that's going to treat them like one of their own. And so you absolutely get attached and it is the hardest thing in the world <laughs> when they leave. Um, and, and it is, it is grief. I mean, you do grieve over losing these children when they leave. Um, but I think that is where as believers, faith comes in that we can trust the Lord to sustain us through that grief um, that we can. And I, I think, if you're a non-believer, I can see why that would be enough to just make you stop because, because it is that hard um, sometimes. But I think it is when you choose to foster, you choose to trust that the Lord can sustain you through that grief, that the Lord is um, doing what's best for these children, what's best for you. Um, so it's just really trusting the providence of the Lord. But it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't make it less hard. And when people say that, you know, that's a reason not to do it. I mean, I think that's a way, a way that you can step out in faith is to do it anyway, even knowing that that's going to be that hard. Yeah. Does anybody another... else, anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, it was interesting in our class when we, when we were, went to the new foster parent classes, uh, I think there was, what, nine couples in the class? Um, about half of them, I think, were there with the intent of wanting to adopt um, eventually, and the other half were just felt called to fostering, uh, regardless of, of what direction it went. Um, there certainly is a you know, would you say 50% of them end up not reunifying? So um, that certainly is an, a, a path for adoption. Um, it can be a, sort of a, a cumbersome path. Um, mm -hmm. It just, nothing moves fast um, through, the, through the foster system, and through the legal system, as far as even when parental rights have been terminated, it, they still have to do exhaustive searches for uh, you know, if there's a, a father that hasn't been in the picture or any other relatives, and it can, it can take a while, but um, it certainly is a, a viable um, means of, of going through that process to adopt. And, and certainly is financially significantly cheaper than private adoption. But again, it, it can be a, a little bit of a heart-wrenching experience, uh, I think. Um, but the important thing to get to know is, and I know Jenny mentioned this before, but the goal of fostering is reunification. And so um, I guess if you go into it with that mindset, then, um, then just leave it you know, in God's hands as far as, as how it's going to play out. But um, yeah. If I can give some practical steps as far as things that might be helpful if the church wanted to say, okay, I think fostering is great. Um, what can I do? <laughs> um, I would say, first of all, you could become a foster parent. Um, and I, I think a lot of times, you know, people will say, um, well, I'm just waiting for God to say yes. And they've been praying about it for years. Well, 
what if instead of assuming God saying no and waiting to hear a yes, you assumed God said yes and just wait to hear a no. <laughs> um, I think a lot more people could do it than do because there is that fear and that's completely understandable. And we've certainly walked through that. Um, but there are um, inquiry classes. There are like a, I think I posted on my Facebook page today where you can, it's just a question and answer. You can go and you can get questions answered about what's involved in foster care. You can find out about it um, through one more child. If you wanted to become a foster parent, the way it would work is um, I, you would fill out an inquiry form, just a little bit about yourself about your Christian testimony, because we are a Christian agency, um, prove, you know, do like a proof of income that you can support yourself. You don't have to be well off by any means, just enough that you can support your family. Um, and you have a, to have a pastor reference. You have to be actively involved in a, um, a Bible teaching church. Um, and once you do that, then you do the quality parenting classes, which Ken had talked about. It's 24 hours of training, usually done over a weekend, sometimes spread out over a few weeks. Right now we're doing them over Zoom. Um, once you have that, you have two home studies and a stack of paperwork that is not hard. It's just tedious. Um, the home study really is not hard. You just have to prove that you have a safe home. Um, and that's pretty much it. And you can become a foster parent. Um, so that would be the way that I think um, would be the obvious choice of if you want to help foster kids, that's a great way to do it. But if you really feel like this is not a time in your life when you can foster care, um, to do foster care in that way, um, I think that the next thing is we have um, a ministry within One More Child, and a lot of churches have what they call a wraparound ministry, where these families literally wrap around these foster families, and they, you know, they take a family and they um, I, I just picture it like a big hug <laughs> and they, um, provide meals, they babysit, maybe they bring them coffee. If they have older kids, they volunteer to help them with their homework, mow the grass, um, help with their other children, spending one-on-one -on -one time with them. If they have a newborn, come over and let them take a nap, <laughs> you know, those kind of things. But they're a wraparound. We have, um, where I work, we call them the foster crew. They're the people that come in and they, um, help. If you are looking for a, an agency that does that now, there's one called Foster Florida that you can find on Facebook, and they will plug you in with foster families in the area if you don't know one. Um, I will be happy to plug you in with a foster family <laughs> if you don't know one um, that you can just wrap around and you can help them. Um, another way is that you can mentor a child, an older child, maybe a teen or a teen mom who is in the system and they just need someone to come alongside them, like the Big Brother, Big Sister program. Um, you can become a guardian ad litem. Um, a guardian ad litem is basically a court appointed advocate that is just there for the best interest of the child. They are neither pro foster parent or pro biological parent or pro adoptive parent. Their only goal is what is best for the child. And you come in to visit this child, whether they're with their bio parent or with their um, foster parent and you just spend time with them. And you are the one that goes to court and you tell the judge, this is what I see is best for the child. Um, you, as we talked about earlier, you could be a, a respite provider. Um, you can be someone who just can take children on the weekends or, you know, for a week or two, you know, you could be an emergency placement provider. So when we have a call, I got a call last Wednesday night at 11 o'clock at night. And it was a case manager that says, I have a two month old little girl, I need a home. <laughs> so I'm calling homes at, you know, 11 o'clock at night trying to find we need emergency placement homes, someone that will be willing to answer the phone at midnight and say, okay, you can bring them here, even if they don't stay long-term. Um, you can be an emergency placement home. Um, you can donate um, things that help um, this little girl that came to us, as most, or, most foster kids do, she showed up with a garbage bag. That is her whole life in that garbage bag. Um, and that's what most foster kids have. You can donate a suitcase or a duffel bag, clothing, um, Christmas gifts around Christmas time for foster families. You can buy Christmas gifts for the kids, back to school supplies, um, even the extras like for older kids, um, you know, video games and stuff like that. They don't have the extra things that you might buy for your children or another child their age might have. Um, so that is something that, you know, you could just kind of take them in in that way. And obviously, Above all of that is to pray for them and to just have a family, a foster family or adoptive family that you are praying for and to let them know <laughs> that you're praying for them. Because I do, 
I don't know if we talked about it earlier, but I do think spiritual warfare is very real part of this whole process. I honestly felt like um, when we first started fostering, like the rug just got pulled out from under us <laughs> in so many ways. And I really believe that Satan hates children and he hates families and he wants to destroy the family. And when he sees believers coming together to minister to these children and minister to these broken families, like it just, all the forces <laughs> come against you. And so um, praying for these families, I think is just so, so important. Um, and to let them know that, that you're doing that. So, um, so yeah, those are some practical ways. Um, I would love to talk to anybody more, you know, about how you can become a foster parent, what else you can do. Um, there are so many other ways that you can serve. And one thing I think is really exciting is I, it would not surprise me at all if one or more of our kids ended up being foster parents in the future as well. Um, I think they've really, um, captured the vision for this, that they really have got a heart for, um, for foster care. And, and so I'm just excited to see how this plays out in the future in our family, not just our family, but our kids' families as well. Um, I know we're getting close to the end of time, but I, I will say that fostering would be very difficult to do uh, if you were an isolated family. But to be able to do this as part of this church family, uh, to be a part of this church that loves children, and uh, are doers of the word, not just hearers, but doers of the word and, and put into practice all the things that we, we preach uh, has been just a blessing to us. Just uh, we're so grateful for all the families that have come around us um, and for the support through prayers and, and, um, and just an opportunity to share with us uh, on, in this forum tonight. We're greatly appreciative of everybody. Thank you. Well, we really, uh... Um, appreciate you guys, Ken, and um, and just the the testimony of, of, of faithful living that uh, that you've given us as a as a church. We really, really appreciate it, and I and I hope that uh, as people watch this and get a little bit a bigger a better glimpse of, of foster care, that um, uh, they can come alongside and be a better help um, to any any foster parents that are in our church uh, in the future, including you. Um, or become foster parents themselves. I think that would just be a, a wonderful testimony to, um, again, the being doers of the word. So uh, we really, really appreciate y'all and, um, and all the other, the adoptive families in our churches, the, the Franzones and the Collishes and the Harrises. And, um, just uh, really, uh, really appreciate y'all. Thanks, Al. Yeah. Well, let me uh, let me close this out in prayer, and um, unless anybody has any other questions, last last chance. All right, you're probably reserving them all privately for the McNeils, so you can go and talk to them at church after church on Sunday. So, uh, let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for um, your uh, love for children. Uh, that uh, while uh, the Lord Jesus was on the earth. He uh, said to uh, uh, permit the little children to come unto him. And uh, Father, I pray that um, the McNeil's uh, testimony of being uh, a light of uh, Christ in this area, um, letting the children come to Jesus through them uh, would be picked up and would be modeled uh, and replicated by others in our body, and that Jenny's ministry out in the community would be fruitful, uh, that she would train up other foster families and uh, provide the, uh, the guidance needed um, to, uh, 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 to increase the number of uh, foster parents uh, in our community as, so, as is so desperately needed. Uh, would you bless them? Would you bless those who who are um, considering this even tonight. And uh, we ask you to do all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who is Lord and Savior of all. Amen. Well, thank you guys. Thanks everybody for, for tuning in. And uh, hopefully on, uh, if you're tuning back in on YouTube after this is over, um, uh, give the McNeils a call and uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you some more. So thanks, right. Kim. Thanks, thanks Jenny. Good night, Joe. Thanks.